Hello. Have you ever come across two opposing concepts when you're trying to learn a new subject that seem quite incongruent with each other, they don't seem to quite make sense, but both seem to be true? Well, geology is no different. It's another one of those subjects with loads of anomalies and seeming contradictions. If I said to you that 70% of the Earth's crust is made up of silicon dioxide, otherwise known as quartz, but if you were to look up what is the most abundant mineral on Earth, you'll probably find the answer is feldspar, you're wondering how can those both be true? Well, in this episode we're going to talk about rock forming minerals and I'm going to answer that exact question. So let's take a look at the minerals we're going to have a look at today. Doing these videos isn't as easy as it looks. Like I get really stressed and I lose the ability to know what to say and my editor's so like, hey, <laughs> let's up for a fun time. Let's take a look at where we've been so far. First I talked about what a mineral was and what a mineral wasn't. We talked about the definition of a mineral and the characteristics that it needed to have in order to be a mineral. And then I started to talk about the fact that minerals are divided into categories, rock forming minerals and non rock forming minerals. And in this particular case, I chose all forming minerals. There are a few other categories of rock forming minerals that aren't all forming minerals but basically I decided to break them up into those two main groups rock forming minerals and ore forming minerals. Today we're going to look at rock forming minerals. This is a really big group and I'm going to try and break it down so that it actually makes sense both to students who are trying to grapple with the subject right through to raw beginners. When it comes to rock forming minerals we're basically talking about the silicates. It's a really big group of minerals. Our primary silicate is quartz. It's made up of silicon dioxide. It's a very simple formula SiO2 and SiO2 is found so abundantly that's where that statistic comes from. 70% of the earth's crust is made of quartz but it's not necessarily just made of quartz. That molecule SiO2 can be bound up with loads of other metal ions and non-metal ions and that creates the silicate group of minerals. When it does that we have loads of other groups of minerals Minerals like the feldspars, micas, amphiboles, pyroxenes and olivines. And that's the main group that we're going to concentrate on. But today we're going to talk about the big three of rock forming minerals, the holy trinity, quartz, feldspars and micas. Let's have a look at quartz. Quartz as SiO2 can come as that usual prismatic six-sided hexagonal prism that we often think about. And I hope in editing he's going to put pictures of these up as we go. Yep, he's got thumbs up on that one. Excellent. But we can also find it in rocks like igneous rocks and metamorphic rocks, so like granites and schists and gneiss. And when it appears in those rocks, it tends to appear less as that typically formed crystal as much as it does in a fairly generalized opaque mineral that you're not really quite sure what it is. And that's largely because of the environmental conditions that it formed under the quartz it hasn't had an opportunity to form its perfect crystalline shape. But it's quite easily identifiable in many rocks like the igneous rocks like granites because it is the one with the least color and the least form. Because quartz tends to have a conchoidal fracture when it's broken, if you break open a piece of granite it's not going to form really nice cleavage planes or really nice flat crystal faces that specifically identify it as quartz. So that's why it tends to look not the nice perfect specimen of crystalline quartz that we think of. The next group of minerals in this holy trinity of rock forming minerals are feldspars. These are a mammoth group of minerals and if you are studying geology and mineralogy and you are confused by it you are not alone. Even the most experienced geologists can get them wrong. It's a speciality all of its own to understand mineralogy and these subgroups but I'm going to attempt 
attempt, I said, notice I said the word attempt to summarize them for you. Feldspars come in two main categories. We have a feldspar, mainly potassium based feldspars, and they are the orthoclases. And then we have the sodium and calcium feldspars, and they're known as the plagioclases. Let's have a look at the categories of those feldspars. Remember I said they come as potassium-based feldspars, which are orthoclases. Then we have the sodium and calcium ones, which are more plagioclases. These are found in specific rocks. When we're talking about specific rocks, we're talking about felsic, intermediate, and basic categories of igneous rocks. It used to be called acidic and basic with intermediate, but now it's more referred to as felsic, intermediate and mafic. And I'll give you an example of what we're talking about. This that I have here is a granite. That This is not only a granite in the generic term, which a lot of people apply to igneous rocks being some kind of solidified molten mass. The pink material in this igneous rock is orthoclase of some particular variety. And there are subgroups in with the orthoclases and the plagioclases. The orthoclases tend to be a smaller group, and the plagioclases a much larger group, but I'll explain that one in a minute. Then we come to intermediate igneous rock, and this one is a diorite. You can see that this is a white feldspar of some kind. And then we come to mafic igneous rocks. We come to an example, this one's called gabbro. Now I've got this on a slab as a cut piece because gabbro can be really hard to determine what minerals are actually in there. It's quite hard to see because they're generally all dark. But here's the actual little example. It's a bit hard to see what's in there, but that technically is a gabbro. But I actually bought this polished piece which is an offcut from a bench top, very frequently used in kitchens, so that you can actually see the different mineralogy that's in there. It's a little bit clearer. When we talk about the spectrum of feldspars, we're talking about feldspars that are potassium silicates through to feldspars that are sodium and calcium silicates. And as you can see by the formulas up there, the silicate component is a large percentage of the mineral. That's particularly important because what we're actually showing you here is that when we say that 70% of the Earth's crust is made up of quartz, it's actually silicon dioxide, it's not only just quartz that we think of as the normal quartz, but it's bound up in other minerals like feldspars and micas. Now, to simplify, yeah, right this concept, I'm about to put up what's known as a phase diagram of the entire silicate group of minerals within igneous rocks. This is really scary for a lot of people. Don't worry about it if it just blows your brain. It scares a lot of students when they first look at this. But I'm going to put it up on the screen. It tells you the percentage of that one particular mineral for each particular type of igneous rock. As you can see, they're all silicates. Every single one of those are silicates. There's the quartz, the feldspars, the micates, there's the orthoclase, the plagioclase group. Then there are the olivines. Then there are also the groups called the pyroxenes and amphiboles, and they're found in the mafic and ultramafic rocks. It helps you understand that the minerals occur in a spectrum, and that spectrum is what we're actually trying to convey and teach students when we're showing them the importance of rock forming minerals in igneous rocks. So let's move on to some micas. I adore micas, they're absolutely beautiful. Micas have had a range of uses, not just as rocks for their components in industry and whatnot, but they've had a variety of uses just as the mica sheets themselves. Believe it or not, they've even been used in the costuming in Outlander. Yeah, we're Outlander fans. What they did was they embroidered tiny, tiny little sheets of the little micas into Claire's wedding count in season one but oh, I was so impressed when I found that I was just I was just so, so excited when we talk about micas we're talking about two main groups there are loads of varieties in between but they're basically muscovite and biotite now where they are found in both igneous and metamorphic rocks and some sedimentary rocks is going to depend on the mineralogy of the overall rock basically muscovite 
is a clearer, lighter colored mica. It forms large sheets, much, much larger sheets than biotite, although biotite can form larger sheets, won't form the much larger ones that you find in in some other metamorphic rock. But then we have biotite, and biotite is a black mineral. Just think of B biotite black, that's quite easy. But it's also quite a small flaking mineral. And when you look at a granite, so let's take this granite for example. In this granite we have the pink, we have a greyish opaque mineral, which is actually quartz, and then we have little black specks. That's actually biotite. When we're looking at this intermediate rock here, those tiny little specks are also biotite. Muscovite is going to be found largely in pegmatites. Pegmatites are igneous rocks that are often formed in hydrothermal veins and they tend to form really large sheets. I hope that helps to clear up this really murky subject. When it comes to rock forming minerals, we have two groups. We have the rock forming minerals of the silicates and ores. Then in the silicates, we have mostly quartz, feldspars and micas. But if we put those quartz, feldspars and micas onto one side, the other group, which is the olivines, pyroxenes, amphiboles, garnets, etc., they're known as accessory minerals. These three here, the ones that we call, well, I've dubbed the Holy Trinity, is because they are such a prolific group of minerals that are just absolutely found everywhere. And when you're studying geology, will be the three main minerals that you are asked to learn to identify and understand their formation and occurrence. So let's have a look at some samples. I'll be with you in a sec. Okay, let's start with quartz. Silicon dioxide, SiO2, forms naturally in prismatic crystals. A six-sided prism with a point on the end. We have different names for quartz depending on their colour, so we might call them smoky quartz or amethyst. This one here has got a little bit of brown, that's what we call smoky quartz. If it's purple, it tends to be called amethyst. Some people like to think amethyst is a different mineral all of its own. It's not, it's just purple quartz. It's really pretty, but it's just purple quartz. The impurity is iron, that's what enables it to have the color that it has. I'll bring this one close to the camera. Here we've got an example of quartz, nice tall quartz crystals, nice hexagonal prisms with little points on the end. This one's covered in calcite and a couple of other minerals. There's even some pyrite and chalcopyrite amongst that one. So quartz can appear absolutely anywhere. It can appear with some metallic minerals, it can appear with other silicates and it can form the most stunning rocks. It's actually really quite a beautiful mineral but we do tend to find it in igneous and metamorphic rocks as a less interesting crystal. This one here is particularly stunning. This is the close-up that I used at the beginning of the episode in the intro. These beautiful, really well-formed crystals. That absolute, the clarity of them is absolutely beautiful. And this one here is probably one of the better examples. Quite a perfect hexagonal prism with a point at the end. Beautiful. So that's quartz. And we can see quartz in a variety of ways in different specimens. So this here is just uh, a rock. This is pyrite. It has uh, a different ground mass of some kind. There are a couple of prisms of real quartz there, but then there's some what we call amorphous quartz through here as well, and that is pure silicon dioxide that is crystallized out, but it hasn't had the space to be able to form perfect prismatic crystals. It's really important for quartz or any crystal to be able to have space to grow perfect crystals that we find in these particular shapes. For example, this would have been chipped off of a cavity wall of some kind. So if you can imagine some kind of cavity inside of a larger rock and these have crystallized out on the walls of that particular cavity. So that's how we get crystals like this. Okay, let's talk about feldspars. Our first feldspar that we're going to talk about is orthoclase. Orthoclase is a potassium silicate. It belongs to the monoclinic crystal system. Orthoclase can come in a variety of shapes and colors. Here's another piece of feldspar, orthoclase feldspar. This is a rock because it has two or more minerals in it. It has a feldspar, it has quartz, and it has a darker felsic mineral here. We've also got another colored orthoclase, and this one is a green one called amazonite. Amazonite is actually a polymorph to orthoclase, and that simply means 
it forms a different mineral based upon the chemical and physical environments that it formed in. It's basically still the same chemical formula, but its internal crystal structure is different and it's going to be different in colour. However, it is still a feldspar. It is quite vitreous on its crystal faces. It still has the same cleavage planes as the other feldspars. And despite how different this one looks to both of those two, trust me, they're all feldspar. And I'm simply doing this to demonstrate just how varied and complex the family of feldspars can be, even within their own subgroups. That's all the clays. Let's move on to plagioclase. So here we have a plagioclase. The plagioclase is the white mineral in this rock, not the green. This is a feldspar found mostly in the mafic igneous rocks. And we can tell in particular with this one that that is definitely the case because see this really dark green mineral here? That is also found in mafic igneous rocks and metamorphic rocks, high grade metamorphic rocks. It's called epidote. It's quite a really pretty green mineral. Now, this one comes in a different crystal shape system to what the orthoclase does. The plagioclases belong to the triclinic system. And the triclinic system has no 90 degree angles in any of its faces and we can see that particularly here in this one whereby that is a complete oblique angle. And the third crystal face which is going to be difficult to find on this specimen but trust me there is no 90 degree angle there either so every single one of its crystal faces are oblique angles just to show you the different forms that that mineral can come in here's another mineral here's another plagioclase mineral it's a slightly different one we won't go into that but you can see that this mineral, this is again in a rock because it's more than one mineral present in the rock. This one has a different feldspar in here, but you can still tell that it is actually a feldspar. It too has come with much darker minerals, uh, epidote, probably some adrene, and probably some tourmaline or augite as well. And that is a mafic or darker colored, and that belongs to more of the mafic group of rocks. You can also see in this little piece here, that once again, the, the plagioclase is white, off-white, can come in a variety of other colours. There is an entire group of minerals in this as one, as I said, because they can be either calcium tectosilicates or sodium tectosilicates. But the primary form you'll find them in igneous and metamorphic rocks is as this pale grey to white feldspar or feldspathoid mineral. There we go. Okay, so let's have a look at the micas. What we have in front of us are samples of the two main groups that I talked about, the muscovites and the biotites. So here we have a muscovite and here we have a biotite. And the biotite is the blacker of the two. Usually biotite doesn't form these really large sheets. It's quite unusual. It's more typical form is to be found in much smaller samples such as these and in igneous and metamorphic rocks. Let's just talk about these for a minute. Micas form in these huge sheets because the bonds in their crystal structure are very tight between each other, going sideways and lengthways, but not above and below. And that's what enables them to cleave in these really, really small crystal faces. And these are what I said were embroidered into Claire's gown in Outlander. How pretty is that? But muscovite and biotite come not only as these two particular minerals, they also come in a variety of other colors. Here we have a purple mica called lipidolite. Now, these can form really large sheets. I've got one in the pegmatite. And then we have a green one here, a very obviously green one, that's called rosacoalite. I have problems pronouncing that one. You can see just how deep and beautiful that color is and that color is a reflection of the mineralogy inside of it. The crystal structure is still the same but impurities in the crystal have enabled it to form these different colors. Changes the shape and the form of it very very slightly but again that's that's something you don't really need to worry about. So there we have it, our three main rock forming minerals, quartz, feldspars and micas. Feldspars come in this enormous array but we break them down into the two main classes of orthoclase and plagioclase. Then with micas, we break them down into 
muscovites and biotites. There are loads of others in between, as I showed you, but they're the main rock forming ones that we're concerned about when we're looking at igneous and metamorphic rocks. And then we have quartz, such a ubiquitous molecule found both in its pure form of crystalline quartz as well as bound up in other ions making up all of these other silicate minerals. And that's where the term 70% of the Earth's crust is made of silicon dioxide or quartz has come from. Not just quartz, the crystal, but as silicon dioxide bound up in all of these other minerals. I hope you've enjoyed that. I hope you've learned something and understood it. Now I'm open for questions. Send me some questions. I'll address them in another episode. I'm really excited to be doing this. So the next one, we're going to move on to the accessory minerals. So I'll see you then. Bye.